Tiger Woods is the last person that you would mention on Super Bowl Sunday. But he made this quote. Everyone knows the Masters, even if they're not a golfer. People know what Wimbledon is, even if you're not a tennis player. And absolutely everyone knows what the Super Bowl is. There are certain events that people just know about. So I want to take that last line. There are certain events that people just know about. I don't know if you know that the Bible is full of a lot of events that basically everybody knows about. As a matter of fact, you could even have newscasters that are describing something that took place on a big level and they'll say it's of biblical proportions. Why? Because it's talking about these events that people know about. I'm going to talk a little bit about a young man in the book of Genesis. He was 17 years old and his name was Joseph. He was the youngest of eight boys and his father gifted him with a coat of many colors. And the reason his father gifted him with that coat is not because he loved his son more than his other sons, but because he saw something on his son. He was marked, it seemed, by God. There was something about him that caused him to stand out among the rest of his children. Thus, he saw the mark in his heart, so he gave him a mark so that others could see through this coat of many colors. This coat would have been worn by princes that were richly decorated robe that stretched to the ankles. A, a common coat would fall to the waist and wouldn't go below that, but he was wearing one that said that he had a mark. Um, it would have set Joseph apart from the rest of the family, and so it caused jealousy. And it caused the other boys to become so enraged and feel such strong feelings towards him that they plotted to kill him and to lie about it. This is an event that's taking place in a family. That word event that, that Tiger Woods said, there are certain events that people just remember or know about. That word event means a noteworthy happening. I want you to remember that as we go through this message the rest of the day, that an event is a noteworthy happening. So my first point today is when you're marked by God, others will plot against you. When you're marked by God. What do I mean marked by God? When you choose Christ... When you make a decision to be a Christ follower, God marks you. And he marks you in a way that the spirit realm can see you, but excellence will begin to come out of you that couldn't come out any other way. Because what is on the inside of you where there was no light, suddenly, just like in the beginning, God speaks light on the inside of you. And now you can see things clearer and others see you in a different light because of that, just like Joseph. The brothers agreed not to kill Joseph, but to sell him into slavery. Well, there's a step up. And to tell their father he was killed by a wild animal. So they soaked his fabulous coat with the blood of animals so that his father would think that he was killed out in the wilderness. God marked Joseph for a purpose. But here he is thrown into a pit, sold into slavery, and becomes a servant in Potiphar's house. While in Potiphar's house, I want you to hear this, while in Potiphar's house, Potiphar's wife noticed his excellence and so did Potiphar. Potiphar brought him to be the head of his household. Potiphar had lots of land, lots of servants. He, was, he worked directly for Pharaoh. He was the chief executioner in the prison. This guy dealt with people harshly. How would you like that to be your boss? He is now the head of this house. Do you know what he received as an honor to be the head of that house? He received a coat. And that coat said to everybody who came on the grounds that he was in charge when the master was away. Yet when we see Potiphar's wife is drawn to Joseph and what does he do? He's in the bedroom and she begins to pull on his coat. The same way that the sons pulled on his coat. God had anointed him and marked him. His father marked him. They took his coat. God had anointed him and, and Potiphar had anointed him with a coat. And the one thing that he left behind when Potiphar's wife was trying to uh, have a relationship with him that he knew was wrong, she took his coat. 
He keeps being stripped of his outward anointing that shows that he's somebody. But when, I, when you make choices, when you make right choices, it doesn't matter what people pull from the external. It's what's on the inside that will always make you rise. And so he ends up in the prison, and in the prison, he becomes the one who's in charge of the prison. In the prison, he receives a tunic that says to everybody who comes in the prison, he's in charge. Three coats, three promotions, every time pushed down. And from there, he became the vice president at 30 years old. He became the vice president of the most powerful nation on earth, Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. And what did he receive? A coat. You see, we, we've got to remember that, that people will plot against you. As a matter of fact, in uh, Genesis chapter 39, verse 1, it says, The Lord greatly blessed Joseph so that everything he did succeeded. And when you make choices, everybody say, I choose. When we choose to do the right thing, no matter what other people are doing, God will make sure that everything you do will succeed. It doesn't mean that it will be easy, and it doesn't mean there won't be pushback, and it doesn't mean there won't be people who plot against you and talk about you, and listen to me, and try to take your coat. But they can have my coat, but they can't have my choices. They can strip me from the outside, but I'm going to stay true to God on the inside. Genesis chapter 41, this is what Pharaoh did. Pharaoh gave um, this Hebrew boy, he wasn't even an Egyptian, he was a Hebrew. He was a commoner as far as Pharaoh was concerned. He was not of royal descent, but he was marked of God. He rose no matter what came against him. And the Bible says that Pharaoh changed his Hebrew name to an Egyptian name, and it says the meaning was this He has godlike power of life and death. Well, the Bible says that we've read this a couple weeks in a row, that life and death are in the power of the tongue. So this tells me that what, 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 whatever went on in Joseph's life, he kept his tongue in order. That he spoke what God said about him rather than what his brothers said, rather than what Potiphar's wife said, rather than what Potiphar said, rather than what the jailer was saying. He said what God said and he rose to the place God put him. And so he was, a, he, he was noticed as somebody. He's the youngest. He's of eight boys. He's the youngest. And God brings him into this place of power. Gave him a name. And he gave him a wife. And Joseph became famous throughout the land of Egypt. And wherever he went, they would shout before him, kneel down. And Pharaoh declared to Joseph, I, the king of Egypt, swear to you, you will have complete charge over all the land of Egypt. I read this quote, the events in our lives are what shape us, but it's the choices we make that define us. Listen, Joseph didn't see any of these events. He didn't see any of this coming. How many of you in life, it's been like that for you? There's been some events you didn't think were going to come. There were some situations that came at you. But can I say to you, when you're marked by God, it doesn't matter how far that situation tries to push you down. If you will choose to do the right thing, God will raise you up every single time. So there are events in our life that try to shape us, but the choices we make are what define us. It doesn't matter what happens. It's what we choose in the middle of the event, whether or not God is going to be able to do what he said he was going to do. First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14, it says, Don't neglect the spiritual gift in you. Practice these things and live by them so that your progress will be visible to all. So we're saying, I choose, and I'm adding to that this week, I choose to practice. Everybody say that on the count of three. One, two, three. I choose to practice. Practice what? Practice the things that God's put on the inside of you spiritually. Why? So that people will be able to see the progress and it's visible to all. In other words, what you do in secret, God will show publicly. And that goes both ways. Matter of fact, these shoes I'm wearing this morning have a little story behind them when it comes to 
People being able to see progress. I, I have a closet and sometimes I put shoes in. I'll get new shoes and I don't know why I do this. I get new shoes. I'll take the old shoes and I'll put them in the old box and I'll put them up on the shelf sometimes and I won't throw them away. I don't know why I do that. So I had all these boxes. I was cleaning out my, my um, closet. So I was throwing away and I'm opening up. Look, old shoes, old shoes. I open them up. A brand new pair of shoes was in a box up there. They'd been up there since 2006. I have brand new vintage shoes on this morning for Super Bowl Sunday, thank you very much. You wish you could have a pair. They don't make them anymore, baby. <laughs> but you see, when we do this, when we do things in the dark, our progress is shown in the light. These have been in the dark. And when I open the box, I've brought them out so everybody can see them visibly. And this is what God wants you to do with what you believe is godliness. Everybody say, I choose, I choose. to practice. practice. Practice what? The things of God. Don't neglect what God's done. He's marked you. It doesn't matter. It's like one preacher said, I woke up this morning. I, didn't, I felt sleepy, not saved. I felt sleepy, not saved. You're not going to wake up and always feel God. You're not always going to wake up and have that coat of many colors, that coat of I'm in charge. You're probably, you might wake up and feel the complete opposite. The world's out of control. But how many of you know when the world's out of control, if you'll choose to lift your hands and praise him, he'll bring the world into order. Everybody say, I choose. I choose. So our first, first uh, point was when you're marked by God, others will plot against you. My second point is not all events are enjoyable. Come on, somebody. Not all the events in our life are enjoyable. However, when we choose to practice godliness, it will be remembered for deliverance. You see, what we choose to do in the middle of the event that we didn't see coming is going to determine whether God can deliver us or we stay in the negativity. And the fact that, he, that Joseph was named someone who had godlike power tells me that when the negative things came in his life, he never spoke that this is the way my life's going to be. He always reminded himself of his coat. You need to remind yourself whose child you are. I am a child of the living God. My brother's name is Jesus. And the Holy Spirit has been sent to indwell me. And if God be for me, who can be against me? Now, we got two teams that are saying the same things in the locker room, and I'm not sure who God's for. We'll find out when, after tonight, all right? Hey, we got Christians on those teams. You understand? We got Christians on those teams. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you a video that shows you who's going to actually be on the field tonight. Turn your eyes to the screen. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles. The credit belongs to the man who was actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood. This man strives valiantly and who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. Today is a day to dare greatly. There's a certain electricity, there's a certain energy about LA that I think is different than most parts in the world. Just the atmosphere is, is amazing as well. I mean, you know what they say, it don't rain in Southern California. 
And the fans are absolutely amazing. They always come in full force and they're just screaming as loud as they possibly can. City of just love, just people, family for me. Uh, really just, this is home base. This is where I grew up. LA is awesome. The weather's perfect. You know, the people here are, are very welcoming. I mean, it's such a blessing to be in this position. You know, this is something I've dreamt of since I was a little boy. So to get the opportunity to go play in a Super Bowl, play for the Lombardi Trophy is incredible. We love it up here. Um, you know, this has been an awesome community to be a part of, and uh, you know, the winters are a little tough, though. The area as a whole, I mean, freezing. <laughs> uh, it's cold. I mean, you know, we have great fans, great place to play. Um, not only are we teammates, but we're friends as well, and you see it by, you know, guys really digging into each other's lives. When I first got here, I was super surprised at how many believers in Jesus we have on the team, and it's a blessing to be here. And we're so excited and, and humbled and, and just thankful for having this experience, so we want to try to make the most of it. We've seen God do some tremendous work in the lives of our families, and they're loving their wives, they're loving their children, and they're being good men, both on and off the field. I think God is just my everything. He's been my crutch to lean on so many times when things are going bad, uh, but I think that constantly refocusing on Him is what's allowing me to continue to be on the straight and narrow and, and continue to be successful on this team. I'm a sinner, um, but at the end of the day, His grace is, is so sufficient um, in my life, and it has been, and not just in my life, but my family's life. I think God in, in my season of life right now is, uh, you know, he's done some heavy work in my life the last couple of years and helped me kind of discover who I am on a deeper level and, and as a man of God and as a father, as a husband. These days I'm discovering God to be uh, really my, my provider, my protector, my healer. It's just amazing the work that, he, that he's doing in my life and my family's life. This year I performed my ACL and so that obviously put into the season, but um, being able to every day work towards finding that, that joy in life that um, only comes from the spirit. There's, there's growth happening. Nothing in the NFL is promised. So waking up with the faith every day that God is in control, that he loves you, and that he's gonna take care of you no matter what, it gives you a peace of mind to, to operate on a daily basis. We try to do what we can by leading by example and hopefully building relationships. Therefore, we're able to feed into the guys' lives and do the best we can just for the kingdom of God. What goes on here that's so special is the brotherhood in this locker room. You know, we've, we've got a lot of men in this locker room that are truly invested in uh, the relational side of things. There's no better group of guys I think that I could, you know, be on a team with them right here. Our culture here in New England is better because of the kind of men Bill and Robert have brought into our building and the way that they've impacted societies and churches and they don't leave anyone the same way. Everything that we do is for Jesus and um, he, he's everything. Everything that we do on the field, everything that we do with our families, everything that we do out there in the practice field is uh, we try to do it for his glory. You know, it's hard sometimes in this sport. You lean on your own understanding a little bit and uh, you know, think you've got it all figured out and all under control and that's not really the case. Before I came to Christ, I was living so much for myself and uh, that's something that I continue to work on every single day. I'm not perfect, none of us are. I've definitely seen, you know, shifts um, work in my life and that's all through knowing him and having the Holy Spirit work through me. God's my everything. I mean, I'm in this position because of him. I mean, you thank him daily, wake up every morning, and I mean, that's the first thing I do just because, I mean, none of this is possible without him. He's proven himself to be so faithful this year. He's grown marriages, families, relationships, and that's so much more exciting than, than football going to the Super Bowl, even though we'll take that. But, uh, um, man, he's been really faithful this year. Pretty powerful, isn't it? Those guys are going to be on the field tonight playing. And they said, I loved what that one guy said. He said, everything we do on the practice field is for Jesus Christ. And that's what we're talking about. I choose to practice. I make a decision that I'm going to practice. I, I read this quote, practice doesn't make perfect. Practice reduces imperfections. And that's just so true. That if you do anything and you do it professionally, you know that you're not perfect at it but you work hard at it on the job, whether, whether you're working in government or you're working in a restaurant or maybe you're a musician or whatever, even up here on the platform, uh, these musicians work really hard, but they make mistakes live in this room in front of you. But a, a true professional just keeps on going like the mistake never happened, knowing that they can carry that mistake over and people can continue to worship.
And so we're not looking to really become perfect, but to reduce the imperfections of how we respond in life. So what are we doing? I choose to practice godliness. I choose to be someone who puts God first. You know, I remember when I was seven years old, I, I played football for one season. That was it. That was my career. As a matter of fact, I didn't even make the whole season. As a matter of fact, I didn't even make the first game. That was my career. I, I, uh, the coach was so tough, and uh, I just decided I was going to bail. I, I chose to quit before our first game. But you know what? That team went on to be undefeated. They were the best ankle biters in the league, and my cousin ended up with three trophies at the end of the season, and I ended up with nothing. And it was because he stuck it out on the practice field. And when you stick it out on the practice field, when you get out in the game, you now know how to handle life. And that's what God wants you to know, that church is practiced, that work is practiced, that family is practiced. But you need to choose the right thing, choose to do things God's way. And when you make a mistake, choose to forgive and choose to get back on course so that when the things of life come at you, you won't be perfect, but you will have reduced the imperfections in your life. You know what I learned? I learned to choose to never quit. I choose not to quit. That At seven years old, I, when he came in with all those trophies, it taught me a lesson. That, hey, when you quit, that's why you don't get the reward. There's, I read another quote. that says, there's no glory in practice, but without practice, there's no glory. I mean, the practice field is the hardest place to be because there's nobody cheering you on and, and that's where they push you the hardest and it's where they point out your imperfections. It's where they say, stop, do it again, stop, do it again. It's where you get weak, it's where you fall down, it's where you need water, but somebody on the team did something wrong so now you're doing back and forth on the field because somebody did wrong and they won't give you any water because of one person. The practice field is where it's the toughest because when we get out in the game is when we need to be able to perform at our highest level and it is that way in life and it is that way spiritually that we choose the fact that there's not going to be a lot of glory behind the scenes but when we get out in front of people God's glory is going to show you know the story of Daniel in the lion's den Daniel is well known for the lion's den we talked about Joseph but a lot of people don't know the backstory Daniel was a man of 23 years old he was not sold into slavery like Joseph was Daniel was a prisoner of war he was scooped up when an invading army came and they scooped up the choicest young men in that nation and brought them back to Nebuchadnezzar so that he would have some of the greatest minds and some of the strongest young men in his palace. But they were not of Nebuchadnezzar's descent. They weren't royalty, but they were smart. His friends were taken captive, and what happened was the difference between Joseph and Daniel, Joseph was sold into, thrown into a pit, sold into slavery, lived in a prison, but Daniel's journey, he was scooped up as a prisoner of war, and he was treated with the royal treatment from day one. From day one, he moved into the palace. From day one, he was eating the food from the king's table. So my third point is this, not everyone's events are going to look the same. Not everyone's journey is the same. Joseph was treated like a slave and a prisoner before his promotion. Daniel was treated like a prince. They both faced trials. Just remember Daniel, the reason we remember him is not because he was promoted. We remember him because he was thrown into a den of lions. And he overcame that. You know what happens when your events don't look the same? They'll, when God's involved, they'll always lead to the same outcome. Your life may not have been perfect and somebody else's life may have been easier. But when God's in it, I promise you, you will both end up in the same place. If you'll make the right choices. Over in Daniel chapter 1, it says this, At the end of ten days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the youth who had been eating the food supplied by the king. They had received the royal treatment. They were told, you're going to be treated like princes and the king is watching you. He is sending the food from his very table to your mouths. That's pretty good captivity, right, when you're eating with the king. But Daniel realized that that food had been offered to idols. 
And he knew what he believed on the inside, so he chose, listen, to continue to practice his faith. And he asked, can we eat just fruits and vegetables and drink water rather than nourish all of that? And they said, but the king is going to notice. He said, if we begin to look like we're not healthy, then we will eat that. And at the end of the trial, it says we just read, they look healthier and better nourished than the youth have been eating the food that the king had supplied. And look at the next part. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other presidents and governors. Listen, for he had great ability and the king began to think of placing him over the entire empire. Does that sound like somebody else we just talked about? You see, their journeys were different. We're not, don't ever compare your journey to somebody else. You stay on your game, you stay focused on God, and you choose to do the right thing. And whether you were raised in a situation that might have been low income and rough, or you were raised in a situation where parents had plenty and everything was easy for you, one way or the other, everybody faces trials. And if you allow God to work in your life, it doesn't matter if a person looks like they're here or here. I promise you when it's all said and done, you'll end up in the same place. Why? Because you chose to practice. You chose to do in the darkness what nobody saw and God shone the light on it. My fourth point is this. Don't compromise to be promoted. When you're marked by God, people are going to come after you. Not all events in your life are going to be enjoyable and not everyone has the same journey. Then my fourth point, don't compromise to be promoted. Joshua 1.9 says, Joshua, God told him, don't let this book of the law out of your mind for one minute. Meditate on it day and night, making sure you practice everything that's written in it. You see, when you practice everything that's written in the Word, part B kicks in. Then you will get where you're going and you will have great success. We read earlier that God made sure that everything Joseph did was a success. Do you remember that scripture? It was because, and we don't really, listen, you know what's interesting about Joseph's life? We don't know what he was doing privately. But we know one thing, he kept getting coats. He kept getting a mark everywhere he went that promoted him. So we, we know that he had to privately be honoring God because publicly God was promoting him. Don't compare your journey. Don't ever compromise so that you can be promoted. Make sure you practice what the Bible says. Daniel chapter 6 and verse 4 because he was raised up, it made the other presidents and governors what? Very jealous. Joseph's brothers were what? Very jealous. And they began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling his affairs so that they could complain to the king about him. It says over in Daniel chapter 6, verse 10, when Daniel learned that the document had been signed, what document? They made it illegal to pray to anybody but the king. You couldn't pray to anybody but the king. And so if Daniel chose to pray to his God, then he was going to be thrown into a lion's den. Look what he did. He went to his house. He went to his upper room and he opened the windows and faced Jerusalem. And he knelt down and prayed and praised his God three times that day. Just, I want everybody to read that last line, just like he... You getting a theme here? Everybody say, I choose to practice godliness. When you practice privately, you'll shine publicly. It was never a problem. What he was doing was never a problem until somebody became jealous. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. It's never a problem until somebody becomes jealous. It's never a problem until somebody starts posting something online. Don't you ever be the source of something being posted online that pulls somebody else down. I'll say this over here. That was really good. Don't you ever be, is anybody listening to me this morning, the source 
of something posted online that pulls somebody else down. Choose to practice. This is what I've decided in my life. I'm not perfect, but this is what I've decided. This is a decision, my choice. I choose, see? I got a wristband, I choose. I've chose, no matter who you are, what you've done to me and what you haven't done to me and what you've done for me or done against me, I'm gonna leave you in a better condition than I found you. I've just made that choice. Now, Eddie Trayer's the person is pretty vengeful. Come on, somebody. How many of you are good at thinking things up to hurt somebody? I don't mean physically. We're all that way. You smack me, I want to smack you back. Right? You spit on me, I will run you over in a parking lot. But I choose. Everybody say, I choose. I choose to practice in my mind privately. God loves this person. Father, forgive them. Somebody finish this for me. Father, forgive them for they... How many of you know Jesus must have been practicing something before he went to the cross? Come on. He had to have been practicing something to be up on that cross and to be, have been beaten and left to die the way that he was and be able to say, Father, forgive them. I can't wait to see that movie in heaven. How about you? I can't wait to see that real run when he actually gave his life for me. But until then, you're going to find me on the practice field. Practicing. Practicing goodness. Practicing godliness. Practicing with the muscle of my tongue and filling my heart that I might not sin against him, that the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth would be pleasing to him. We know what the end was. He was thrown into the lion's den. The next morning, the king ran out there and said, Daniel, what's up? He said, nothing, just been sleeping with the lions. Nothing, it's all good. My God that I've been practicing with sent an angel last night. He was wearing a Redskins jersey. And he stood in here and he closed the mouth of the lions. And the king said, get Daniel out of there. He said, from this day forward, this kingdom will serve one God, and it's the God of Daniel. How many of you want you some of that? Come on, how many of you want you some of that? What does that mean? Your very enemies, because of your example, can one day serve your God. Don't compromise to get promotion. Stay in what you believe. People know about the Masters. People know about Wimbledon. And they know about the Super Bowl. Billions of dollars are spent for these events. Tonight, two gladiator teams will come together and they will go on the field and perform what they have practiced. To you and me, it's a big event. People are right now grilling. People are doing all these things to get ready for the event. To these players, they just say, let me do what I do. Just let me do what I do. It just happens to be the big stage, but let me do what I practice. And that's what God wants you to do. I want you to practice godliness so when the big stage comes at work, when the big stage comes at the doctor's office, when the big stage comes from the banker, when the big stage comes, when, when you're on the stage and it seems like the spotlight's on you and you want the earth to open up, you can do what you practiced. I choose. I'm going to practice. They're going to do what they've done for decades since little boys playing football. And the only reason they're playing on the biggest stage in the NFL this year is because of what they did before today. It's what they did before today that got them where they are. And we can learn a lesson from that spiritually. What we do today 
that's going to affect where we end up tomorrow. I want my life to be a neon sign. It takes being on the practice field of life, dealing with a few disappointments and punches along the way to become what God wants you to be. Would you stand up with me? Does anybody recognize the name Joe Gibbs? Well, around here in Washington, D.C., he's a little godlike to us. Because under his leadership, the Redskins really shine. But do you know that Joe Gibbs was a born-again, spirit-filled Christian? Who loves God with all his heart? So let's read a quote from him. The further you go in life, the more you realize what you're going to leave on this earth. It's not going to be, it was a great platform, it was great to win the Super Bowl. But really and truly, what you're going to leave on this earth is the influence that God gives you with others. Top of his game, unbelievable honor coach. Still today, amazing. Deals with all sorts of things. Has had some hard hits in life, if you know anything about his personal life. But yet his tongue honors God. Because he knows when it's all said and done, the legacy he's going to have is not going to be the Redskins. It's going to be what he leaves behind in helping others. 3 John 11, whoever practices what is good belongs to God. And whoever practices what is bad has not seen 